Give me an A. Give me an I. What does that spell? Power hungry, compute heavy, low latency dependent. Okay, that was definitely more letters than I'd first intended. Yes, it is true that the AI revolution is coming at us faster than ever before. But in order for our AI designs to truly take over the world, we are going to need to solve those very issues I just mentioned. And in order to do that, to achieve low latency, low power, and to address that computational juggernaut that is AI, we also need a neural network accelerator to minimize our data movement, maximize parallelism in our design, and optimize our energy usage. And it sure would be handy if all of that was in one chip. But where would we go to find such a solution? Oh yeah, right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are certainly exciting buzzwords in the world of electronic engineering today. But in order for AI or ML to get into mainstream edge devices, we need to enable true edge inference. And that's what we're doing today. Chris Artis from Maxim Integrated joins me today to discuss the Max 78,000 family of microcontrollers. Chris and I investigate how this new microcontroller family solves those big three AI challenges, the details of its built-in neural network accelerator, and how you can get started using it today. All right, let's get going. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about the Maxim 7800 family of microcontrollers from Maxim Integrated. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. It's great to be talking to you again. Okay, so today we're talking about enabling true edge inference. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. What we are trying to do here with our new device is actually allow the promise of AI, which is a really great and powerful technology, to be built into devices that are battery powered, that are surrounding us, that can be stuck on the wall or powered by solar cells, kind of all the smaller embedded devices that we tend to think about. Okay, Chris, I think I get it. AI lets us see and hear. So does that mean our gadgets are going to be looking at us soon? <laughs> We're not quite there. When we think about AI and that promise of seeing and hearing, you know, a lot of us tend to think about big machines, things like cars and things like natural language processing. When you talk to your home personal assistant and you speak a sentence, it understands you pretty well. But that's kind of what I call the AI side of big machines. Those things, you know, from my standpoint as an embedded guy, they've got infinite cost, infinite uh, space, infinite power budgets. Yeah, I know they're not infinite really, but it sure seems like you can cram a lot into those types of devices. Where I see a big gap is in small machines, things like watches or thermostats or remote controls or tools where really they can't participate in this amazing new technology. You know, they can't participate in this promise of things to see and hear. And so really they're kind of left behind. About the most that they can do today is listen for wake words. And that's really what we want to address. Okay, cool. Now, it seems like these small devices have a big challenge. Why can't they participate in machine learning and AI? So one of the big reasons is because the mathematical calculations that happen in an AI inference are really heavy duty. So one of the workhorse architectures in AI today is a convolutional neural network, and it's super computationally expensive just to process, like we're showing here, an image of a car and try to decide, is this car a truck or a van or a bicycle? It is billions and billions and billions of multiplications. If you remember any of your university math, it's a lot of linear algebra. It's a lot of matrix multiplications. And so what that means is to actually make these things happen in any kind of near real time timing, you need a super powerful processor. And as soon as you start talking about super powerful processor, you're talking about a processor that uh, sucks a lot of energy and a lot of cost and probably a lot of board size too. So that's really what's keeping AI from really getting to the edge. Okay, so Chris, in terms of acceleration, low energy and latency play a big role, right? Absolutely. For this technology to really be adopted and to really shine when it gets to the edge, one, it's got to be low energy. 
you can't have your, your doorbell camera needing to be recharged every day. You can't have your wristwatch needing to be recharged every couple hours. So low energy for implementing AI at the edge is just crucial or it won't be adopted at all. But latency is pretty important as well. If you think about what kind of decisions you want to make with AI, let's take, for example, a drone. A drone's flying and it's heading towards a tree. If it's not seeing that that's a tree or a building or something like that fast enough, let's say it's got to shoot the data up to the cloud and then the cloud says, hey, that's a tree, it's probably too late by the time the data gets back. You've got a drone in pieces. Maybe take another example like a face ID application where let's say you're using your face as a secondary mechanism to get into a door or factory or something like that. If it takes 10 seconds to recognize your face, that's not practical. It needs to happen in something less than 300 milliseconds, which is about where humans can start to recognize time. So it's got to happen fast or it's not going to be a technology that gets adopted. Now, Chris, how can Maxim help me in this space? So we just introduced our first product with a neural network accelerator, and that's the Max 78000. And we're very excited about this product. We've developed this neural network accelerator to really optimize energy and latency for running convolutional neural networks and doing it in a form factor that you could put in a small battery-powered application. Cool. Now, Chris, I'm especially interested in the neural network acceleration part of this. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, that's the most special part of this chip. So that neural network accelerator, it's our own novel architecture. It's something that we came up with. When we were really studying the problem of the convolutional neural network, you know, the first thing that you see is of billions and billions of multiplications. And so your first thought might be, let's make the math efficient. It turns out that you burn a lot more energy in memory access. So if you think about what a math operation looks like, you multiply one number times another number and get a third number. And on a computer and software, what that really looks like is you load your first operand, you load your second operand, you do the multiplication, and then you store your result. So I just said memory access three times, and I said math once. We found that you really burn a lot more energy on the data movement. And so what we did was we really tried to minimize that data movement. So our accelerator is really a very energy efficient hardware state machine that keeps the data close to where it's actually going to be used. And of course, we've worked on making the math more efficient as well, but where we've really optimized for energy is in the data movement. Okay, cool. So what can it do? We can kind of do whatever neural network you throw at this device. And it turns out trying to describe the top end of what a particular neural network size can do is a little bit difficult because there's so much involved in trying to build an optimal neural network and squeeze it down that to this point, I can't really tell you what the top end is that our chip can do. Let me throw a couple examples at you. So we've got a couple out-of-the-box demos that come with our EV kit. One is a keyword spotter. And you see an image of that here on the left where you just say words like up, down, left, right, you know, the numbers from zero to nine, and it'll recognize those. And so that network takes up about 30% of the resources of our neural network accelerator. So still plenty of room left to build a more complex neural network. We also have a, a face ID demo. We trained it with celebrity images, but it turns out that once you train the network to recognize faces, you've actually trained it to learn how to recognize a face. So you can actually add normal people like you and I to that network as well to identify us. That one takes about 40% of the resources. So just a couple examples of what this product can do, and it does a super low energy, and so you can really build in vision applications into true embedded devices. So let me show you a little bit more what this AI chip can do, and let me show you in action. So here's a demo, and I'm going to stay quiet for a second, let the demo run, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. On. Go. So what you just saw was a reference design that we're calling the camera cube. And you can see how small it is. So it's a really powerful tool for showing just how small you can get embedded AI. You saw the engineer say on and the screen turned on. And then you saw him say go. And so there's keyword spotting there. So he's giving verbal commands to the camera cube for it to start operating. 
he starts moving it across the faces and you see the square change colors if it doesn't see any face or if it sees parts of a face but not sure who it is. And then when it turns green, it's positively identified the person that's looking at. So you're seeing a couple different AI applications happen at the same time in this very small, low power form factor device. Cool. So let's bring it back to what we talked about earlier, Chris. Energy and latency are critical, right? So how are we doing here? Here we do really, really well. And so if we're comparing to something like an NVIDIA or a big processor like that, which I, it isn't a straightforward comparison because those are extremely advanced processors that can do things like drive cars. We're not there. We're not at that level. We're targeting smaller jobs. And so what we really try to compare ourselves against is against things like standard off-the-shelf microcontrollers. So what we're showing here is we're showing our Max 78000, which has our neural network accelerator running at 50 megahertz. We're comparing that to one of our own Cortex-M4F microcontrollers, the Max 32650, which is a super low power microcontroller built into wearables. It's also got a big memory space so you can fit some decently complex neural networks in there in software. And then we also are comparing to an STF7, so a Cortex-M7 device running at over 200 megahertz. And we needed to include in Cortex-M7 because those can you know, normally have external memory because these networks get bigger than most Cortex-M4Fs can handle. And so what we're doing here is we're showing both of those demos running on all three, both the inference time, so the latency, and the energy that we spend. KWS is a keyword spotter, the, the audio uh, recognition demo. And then Face ID is the face identification demo. So you can see here that for the Max 78000, the RAI chip, the keyword spotter takes about two milliseconds to recognize a word and 140 microjoules, 0.14 millijoules. And so you can see that that's orders of magnitude faster and lower energy than our low power micro and ST Cortex M7. Same thing on the face ID. You see it takes about 14 milliseconds and it turns out most of that time is in the capture from the camera and not the inference. That's significantly faster than the other devices and significantly lower energy. So you know, what this shows you is we are kind of taking the energy cost away from doing AI at the edge. So you can pretty easily add these types of functions into devices where you never thought it was possible before and it won't break your power budget. Excellent. Now, Chris, how do we develop with this thing? I know machine learning engineers and embedded development engineers use different tools. Yeah, and they're usually different people too. And so we've had to try to bridge those universes a little bit. And so the way we've done that is we're trying to make sure both of those camps of engineers can still use the tools that they're used to using, and then we find a way to marry them in the middle. So on the machine learning side, popular tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow, we support those. We have to do a little bit of work to help those tools understand the limitations of our hardware, but really, otherwise, it's a normal machine learning development process that involves training data, testing the network, evaluating that network, and, and iterating on that. Once you get happy with your network, though, then you get some kind of result, a checkpoint file or an Onyx file. And then we have a synthesis tool that will convert that into embedded C code. And now you're in the universe of the embedded engineer. And so they can take that C code. It will configure our neural network accelerator. It's got some test code in it, so you can just poke at it and make sure it works right. So then the embedded engineer can go to the work of, okay, now I need to get my data from the camera or from this PPG sensor or from the microphone and really start to put the embedded application together. Okay, cool. Now, Chris, if I'm ready to get started with the Max 78000, where should I go for more information? So there's a couple places. Uh, you can go to our website, maximumgrade.com slash max78000. The data sheet's there. Links for ordering the eval kits are there. We also have put all the tools and examples and everything on GitHub, github.com slash maxim integrated AI. And so there's a lot more documentation there on working on the machine learning side with our part. We've got a couple boards available. We've got an EV kit with a nice, big, pretty screen and a camera and microphones. But then we've also got this little tiny feather board that also has a camera and audio inputs and is a little bit better platform for demonstrating this AI technology can be low power, it can be small size, it can be integrated into a real embedded application. Fantastic. Well, Chris, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Amelia. 
And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Maxim Integrated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.